Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Councillor Matthew Winnington, Cameron for Community Wellbeing, Health and Care. Uh, just some housekeeping before we begin. Um, if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room. It's not in the public gallery. By the stairwells, do not attempt to use the lifts. Please ascend by Queen Victoria's statue in Guildhall Square. Um, no one's signed in, so that's fine. Um, and there's no members of press and public, so don't need to do that. Please can everyone use the microphones and remember to switch them off when they have finished. So just do some introductions. Start with you, Anna. Anna Martin, Democratic Services. Richard Webb, Deputy Director of Finance. Andy Biddle, Director of Adult Social Care. Spokesman, sorry, Biometric Opposition Spokesman for uh, for you. <laughs> Just giving you precedence. So I'm uh, Councillor Graham Heaney, I'm the Labour Group Spokesperson for Community Wellbeing, Health and Care. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, no deputation request today. Um, uh, apologies for absence. Okay, we have no um, apologies for absence given, um, but uh, just to note that Kirsty Mellor has stood down as office and spokesperson from the community, uh, Portsmouth Community Independence Party, um, with effect from the 11th of September. So thank you for uh, Kirsty's time as opposition spokesperson. Um, colleagues, any declarations of members' interest? I don't have a declaration of interest, but I'd like to make a comment. Um, oh, to be quite blunt, I'm not really quite sure why we're here today, because this agenda has two items which are for information only. And as the documentation says, there is no information on impact assessments, legal or financial, because it's not required. It also says that being deputations by members of the public may only be made on any item where a decision is going to be taken. There is no decision going to be taken here today at all. Um, we had a briefing just about a week ago where this information was presented to us and we had an opportunity to ask questions so i'm thinking that by the time i shut up we probably this meeting's probably not going to last anything more than 15 minutes and i can't really understand why we need an, an open cabinet meeting to decide something or to actually see something which is information i mean it would pro possibly be pro well, to have this as an online meeting be slightly more convenient as having battled my way through the um the school run to get here and then going to be battling through the um Russia to, 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 to get back to get back home again. Um, so I, I'm really puzzled as to why we're having uh, an in-person meeting. I mean, the Health Area Scrutiny Committee has a lot of items for information um, and has all of its meetings online. Uh, I know it's a scrutiny committee, but again, this is not a decision making. It's absolutely right, and I have no problem with the idea of decisions being made in public forum meetings like this because I think it's right to do so. But I'm not sure whether it's a good use of anyone's time for us to have a formal meeting like this, just for items that are information. Thank you, Graham. Um, I, I think what's important about these um, these uh, things that we have coming to this meeting is the fact that they are public meetings, they are recorded meetings, um, and they are meetings that therefore uh, people can um, be aware of what's going on. In particular, they're about some of the things that would sit most appropriately with this portfolio as opposed to any other um, nature of it. And I think it's, it's, it's something that um, in the past, you're quite right, you would only have uh, meetings where there were decisions that needed making. But then sometimes you, would have, uh, you could have months go by where actually particular decisions weren't needing to be made and therefore there's no opportunity for people to, um, to, people to see exactly what's going on in a formal decision-making meeting. Um, and, I, um, and one of these things is about um, having the things like the Victory Unit update and the working with autism and uh, neurodivergent with transition is because they are current things that this is the appropriate forum them, for them to be done. Uh, and as they come under my responsibility, I want to make sure that that is done in a transparent way and not handed off to um, a, a committee to, uh, who might not have been involved with those at all, but indeed to be done from a place of uh, the person making the decision and who has responsibility for them is presenting them for um, to in a public forum. So that, that's why 
um, we do this now. Um, as I say, when I took over uh, originally in 2018, it was very rare we would do any, uh, uh, any reports just for noting at all. Um, so this is part of just making things a bit more transparent, but also the opportunity to have those in the formal meeting. Well, I, I sort of understand where you're coming from, but I, I still think it would be appropriate to maybe consider having these meetings online rather than having to be physically in here because there is no decision taking. And as far as I understand it, as long as you're not taking a decision, you can have an online meeting. Certainly be more convenient for those of us who work and have to take time out to come into meetings. Um, I mean, the other thing is the, the question of, of, of publicity. I mean, if it's for members, we've got MIS, which you could, inf you could inform members of. It could go as an MIS item. Um, it could also go as a report directly to members for their information. In terms of the public, I mean, the council has lots of opportunities to, to publicise what it does and put information out about it. And it's a question of choosing the most appropriate form for those who might be interested. I mean, I've, whilst I obviously know it's important, I don't think we're going to get crowds of people sitting here watching us discussing this today, much to our, you know, uh, your, your regret. But, you know, so I, I do think we need to rethink this because I think two items on our information is just not a good use of time. Well, thank you very much, Graham. I will take that under advisement. Um, so we will move, uh, move swiftly on to uh, the item number three, which is working with autism and neurodivergence, including transition. Andy. Thank you. So the, the paper is an update um, to a paper that we brought to the portfolio meeting in December of last year, um, uh, where we were talking about uh, the work that we were starting uh, in adult social care, uh, working with people that uh, are autistic and identify as neurodivergent in the city. Um, we've uh, included an update um, through page one into page two around uh, the Room 1 facility currently located at Charles Dickens. Um, and this has been a, a co-created uh, resource um, uh, for um, uh, our residents in the city um, and has become a very flexible resource, not only offering um, scheduled sessions for people on specific topics, but also offering drop-in. We know that um, services in the city, uh, people in the city can experience a lot of stress, uh, can need um, to call upon support. Uh, without necessarily having to book an appointment, and that's been really useful for room one. The next uh, item under 4.2 is around employment support. Uh, we've engaged the U Trust to provide employment support for people with uh, autism and those who don't find neurodivergent in our city, um, and to accept referrals from, from anyone that, that uh, has a relevant referral, really. This is really important. We know that um, for uh, all of our residents that employment can um, can help them in many ways. Uh, it's affirming uh, in terms of the contribution they make to society, but also giving them purpose. And, and we know that people, um, particularly uh, with autism, um, have uh, are underemployed uh, in our society. And so um, this has been a really positive development uh, in the last few months. On that service, uh, I'll put the link there. Uh, and at the survey, the link has several examples of how they've helped people into employment or to maintain employment. We then go on under point five and 5.1 to talk about uh, the transition team and include the staff members that we've employed there. Uh, for some people coming through transition, for those of our younger citizens that need a service when they turn 18, uh, they can often fall through the gaps. Um, if they haven't been referred previously through other uh, children's services or haven't been, their um, presence hasn't been made, made known to adult services. And so the transition team is really important to make sure that people have the support that they need going into adult life, uh, the opportunities that they need, um, and can uh, go on to lead uh, independent and healthy lives. And so our transition team, we've, we've talked as well about the protocol that uh, is currently under review um, to make sure that uh, both children, families and adult social care are working together with our citizens that need it. Um, and there's a clear pathway for people that need support. And then we've talked about um, the safeguarding, uh, those people that need safeguarding support as, as they turn 18. It's a truism that um, children's services are structured very differently from adult services. Um, and that unless it's uh, clearly identified that um, often people can pull, fall through the gaps when they have particular vulnerabilities and may need support, support and advice from a safeguarding perspective. We then come on to talk about workforce development, uh, particularly around the uh, Oliver McGowan training. 
um, and we are rolling out training in the city um, uh, for all of those that work with people with learning disability and, and the Portsmouth um, Autism Community Forum are helping us to ensure that we've got uh, people with lived experience uh, informing and guiding that training that we provide to our staff. Uh, we then go on under number seven, under point seven, to talk about our next steps. Um, the um, Public Health Transformation Fund has enabled us to employ a resource specifically to embed breast practice uh, and to um, make this, this work that we're talking about in this paper business as usual, uh, rather than something we're piloting or, or just starting. So the, the most important bit really though is the outcome, so point eight. Uh, whilst what we've talked about in the rest of the paper is, is around structure, we have two case studies here labelled A and B that talk about our residents, uh, real people, um, who have made use of our services uh, and who have fed back to us that those services have helped them um, um, make positive changes in their lives. Those services have helped them not feel uh, isolated and alone um, and have enabled them to, um, to contribute uh, to their society as well as to offer them support. Um, so that's the, the most important bit of the paper in my view. Um, but happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you, Andy. Uh, any questions, comments? Brian. Andy, um, simply because I don't know. So um, I'm chair of the uh, scrutiny panel for uh, children and young adults. Our figures are... <laughs> I've got to be careful what I say now. Our figures are not as good as I thought they would be with children, young adults, uh, being in employment. And I presume yours are the same, really. You're not happy with the figures. Do we work together? Do the uh, children, young adults work together with you to try and find them? Because I think we've got less than, I think, 375 who should be, or hopefully should be, either in education or in training or in work. Uh, out of the 375, I think there's something like about 160 who are doing absolutely nothing. Um, do the two departments work together on this? Do you work together with them or uh, what's happening there? Thank you. Uh, where people have needs, so where people are going to have needs for um, uh, support through adult social care, then absolutely that'll, that'll be joined up. So, so when um, our younger citizens are transitioning, when they're going to turn 18 and they have particular needs for support, Employment would be one of those things that we'd look at. It would also be noted if, if the young person has a um, uh, health and care plan, um, uh, education, health and care plan, then we'd be, we'd be aware of those and be, we'd be working with them through transition. Uh, for those of our younger citizens who wouldn't necessarily be identified as having needs for adult social care, then probably not, I would have to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so if they if they still got needs, if we're thinking they still will need support post eighteen, and adult social care is the right agency, then yeah, absolutely. I've got most of the figures in my brain, but I haven't got the figures of the children who would come under well, young adults who would come under uh, what you're talking about there. Uh, but we must have some. I can't believe out of three hundred and seventy-five, we haven't got some autistic or what, whatever they may be. Um, so, would they come under you and us, or are they? Just with you. So the, the support that they'd receive as children would come under children's social care, but as soon as they turn 18, the support um, would be focused uh, through adult social care. Uh, depending on... So if, if younger people have been in care, if they've been termed as looked after children prior to turning 18, then there's certain duties and responsibilities that the children's social care would still have toward them. But adult social care would be involved because even those responsibilities will come to an end at some stage in their young adulthood. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Chair. Graham, did you have any... Uh... No, no, as I attended the briefing last week, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, can I just um, ask um, Richard, just give a bit of an idea of um, some of the complexities about uh, moving between children and adults uh, from a financial point of view? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, when children's services, um, the children are not subject to financial assessments or charging, but as they move into adulthood, then they would become under, eligible under the CARE Act for charging for contributions towards some services if um, they have the 
the financial assets and means to pay, otherwise um, they would receive support through um, adult social care services uh, fully funded. So it depends on their financial circumstances and each uh, case would be uh, assessed on a case-by-case -case basis by one of my financial assessments and benefits officers who would also support them to access any benefits or support that they may be eligible to as well. So is there anything else you would like to know? No, that, that, that's great. And that just leads into my comment about uh, how important this work is. Um, and, uh, and, and it is, it is one of those uh, really difficult things. And Andy's alluded to already the, the difference in eligibility um, for support that happens between children and adults due to the different legislation that's under, uh, but also the, uh, from the financial point of view in terms of uh, contributions, because as has as just been confirmed that, that you don't contribute when you're, uh, when you're a child. Um, and I'd just like to sort of thank again the work that's been done, in particular with Room 1 um, and the fantastic uh, facility that is that's been around for about a year now. Is that right, Andy? Yeah. So, uh, so it's a really fantastic, uh, fantastic thing we've got there. Um, and, uh, and obviously, transition has been a priority for uh, this administration for a considerable amount of time, uh, certainly as long as I've been Cabinet member um, and, and in my year out as well, um, and, uh, and London may that continue, and uh, really appreciates the report uh, coming to a public forum, um, and so we can show the work that is being done. So happy to accept that. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you then, Andy, for item four, victory unit update. Thank you. Uh, so in front of you is a, a very short paper. Uh, we, we've had a, um, a unit uh, in Portsmouth that we've used as a reagement service, as a rehabilitation service, but when we needed to focus our resources on discharge to assess uh, on the first floor of Harry Sotnick, that unit was closed because the staff were transferred over to, to Harry Sotnick House. We then briefly used um, the Victory unit uh, as a hospital discharge service. Uh, that was in December last year uh, during winter pressures. Um, but it hasn't been used for uh, any particular purpose since that time. Uh, we, we've been in discussion with uh, Housing, Care, Housing 21 um, about uh, because they operate the sheltered, uh, the sorry, supported living accommodation in, in Maritime House, and uh, the Victory Unit adjoins Maritime House, and they came to us with a proposal to adapt uh, the accommodation there to provide more extra care uh, housing. Uh, this is ground floor accommodation. Uh, it will be adapted so that uh, people uh, with significant physical needs can use it. As we know in Portsmouth, ground floor accommodation is, is limited. Um, and we, our ambition as part of our adult social care strategy is to build as much um, extra care accommodation as we need. So having these additional units within Portsmouth uh, will be a benefit to our, our residents and will offer people a, a real alternative to if they can no longer live at home independently uh, but don't need to be living in a care home, which is the purpose of extra care, having your own front door but having care available on site. So there's some detail on the second page about the process that we've gone through. We're slightly behind where we wanted to be in terms of starting work on this uh, because we've had to ensure that the legal ramifications of surrendering a lease have been taken into account and come to that agreement. We had a meeting today, which I haven't yet had an update from, um, or last week, my apologies, I haven't yet had an update from to give us a, a better time frame for when these works will start. But we anticipate that we'll see increased units, ground floor accommodation for the uh, citizens of Portsmouth with care and support needs. Uh, and we're hoping that that will start soon. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, any comments, questions? No. Um, just thank you so much, Andy, for this update. Um, I know we had a report to portfolio back when we vacated um, uh, the victory units um, back uh, when we consolidated our discharge to assess um, uh, in, during the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and since then, I think a lot of work has gone on to what solution we could make for that, for that space. And uh, obviously with this, uh, with Housing 21 now getting involved and, and giving us the nomination rights for that as, uh, for extra care accommodation, I think is a, a, an ideal outcome. 
And again, I think it's really important to have this um, update in terms of where we are with things in this public forum um, and to make sure that um, it, we are open so people understand and can look back at this recording of this meeting to uh, show about what is going on and indeed can look at the papers if they need to on the uh, council website. So, um, so thanks very much. Look forward to the update from last week's meeting. And, uh, and then uh, once we have that information, if we can circulate it to members in terms of uh, giving an idea of, of, of what the time scale is for that. Uh, and then obviously it would be great uh, once this facility is fully in motion. So that concludes the meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Everybody.